All right. Hi, once again, welcome back, uh, everybody. Hope you had a good break. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's just continue. Uh, um, okay. I see Princess is sharing something. Yeah. I learned that how God loved his people. He is the only one who never leaves us. Yeah. Exodus 25. Yeah. Those who didn't obey him, that he called them again for him to make a sanctuary. Yeah, where he dwells, yes. Um, you know, uh, there's this verse that God keeps saying time and time again in the Bible, okay, from Genesis, and it goes all the way up to Revelation. And you can actually Google to get these verse. This verse, it says, um, I will be their God. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Okay. You can Google all the scriptures that's there that says these lines. Okay, I will be your God, you will be my people, or you will be my God, uh, my my people, and I will be your God. And you re you see that theme from Genesis, and it goes all the way to Revelation, and that is the heart of God, right? That that we be his, that he dwells with us, you know, that he lives with us, that we and him are united. Okay, um, that is such a beautiful heart of a father uh, of our God, and uh, yeah, awesome. Okay, um, so let's resume. Uh, before uh, we just look at the notes, uh, I thought I'd share an image, uh, image of the tabernacle that we already uh, know how it looks, but uh, you know, just to behold, it's it's. Uh, It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, around the tabernacle, uh, you see all the tribes have uh, pitched that. I mean, this is obviously just a, an art, a painting, imagined painting. But um, it should have been something like this, isn't it? Uh, you know, with all the tribes, you know, with their tents uh, around the tabernacle, and uh, and all these. Uh, outer coats with made white and just one gate. It means everybody in every tribe, no matter which tribe you belong to, which which tribe out of the twelve, no matter which tribe you belong to, no matter which direction you are in, north, south, east, west, you would know that your God is holy and the only way Okay, to enter into that presence of that holy God is through this one gate. Not all the sides did not have gates. Only one side had a gate. And you could come only through that gate. Isn't that wonderful when you see, uh, you know, what Jesus says is that I am the gate. Okay, everyone who comes through me will be saved. Um and then you have the outer courts. You and this little thing. Let me see if I can zoom in. Okay. Okay. So you have the altar of sacrifice, or the. And then here you have, the altar of laver, a bronze laver. This is where sacrifices were made. And this is where the priests would come. This laver would be filled with water for priests to wash. Now, we will all look at uh, this in detail as we go, but I'm just giving us, showing this for us to get an idea. Altar of sacrifice, bronze laver. And then the tent. You go in, this is where you will have the holy place and the most holy place. Okay, the holy place and the most holy place. Okay, in the holy place, you will have the table of showbread and a menorah, a, a golden lampstand, and the altar of incense. Okay, there was only three furnitures in the holy place. Uh, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, and, and the altar of incense. Okay, but in here, only one piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant. And 
and where God dwelt. He finally had a dwelling place. After 2,500 years, there was a dwelling place that we could build with the ideas that he gave us, that he showed us, he showed them how to build. It's wonderful, isn't it? Okay. So uh, this is how should have looked. The, uh, there are a lot of pictures on Google that you can look at. Um, the Tabernacle of Moses. Okay. Uh, let me stop here. Um, great. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, I'll share my notes. Okay, so uh, after the gate, after we, uh, you know, we looked at in detail of everything that the gate was made and what it means and what it signifies, uh, we enter the outer court. The outer court contained the altar of sacrifice and a bronze laver of water for washing. Okay, a altar of sacrifice and a bronze laver of water for washing. Uh, our journey into the presence of God begins uh, with the outer court. The outer court is the process of making that decision to move into the presence of God. Okay, and, and getting ourselves ready to meet him. Okay, so the outer court is the process of making that decision to move into the presence of God and getting ourselves ready to meet. Okay, so here we go. The brazen altar or the bronze uh, altar. Uh, let's call it the place of reconciliation. Okay. A place of reconciliation. So the gate is a place of introduction. Okay. This is where we are introduced to Jesus and who he is in all his four offices. Uh, right. And then the brazen altar is the place of reconciliation. Okay. Okay. Um, here we read that in Exodus 27, verse 1 and 2, it says, You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it and you shall overlay it with bronze. Okay, so the altar of sacrifice is where, like we've mentioned, the a sacrifice would happen, okay? So, and if a person committed uh, an, an act of sin, he would come and offer a sheep or a goat, uh, you know, as, as a sacrifice. So he would place his hand on that animal and, the, and, and I believe that the sins would get transferred onto that innocent animal. So, so the thing is, a person who had committed sin can't just give an offering and walk away. He would give that offering and see the priests take it to the altar and see it burn and see it die. So this person will know that an innocent animal took my place where I should have died because the wages of sin is death. I should have been on that altar but an innocent animal is taking my place on the altar. The altar of sacrifice a place of surrender and offering up spiritual sacrifices. We offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. We bring praise and adoration as a spiritual sacrifice. We do good deeds, share, give, and so on as part of a sacrifice we offer up in the outer court. And we're calling this as a place of reconciliation simply because, again, Jesus, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 29, uh, let me see if I can. He says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A Lamb, an innocent, spotless, blameless Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Um, 
was laid upon the altar. He offered himself as a living sacrifice for us, isn't it? And then out of that uh, revelation, we see uh, Paul in Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, this altar signifies the cross. Okay, you, you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you come to terms and you are reconciled uh, with him at the cross, at the foot of the cross. Um, as you begin to have this revelation that he is the spotless lamb that took your place where I should have been on that cross, but Jesus took your place. And, um, and that's, why reconcil that's where reconciliation begins, right? Uh, you know, uh, it, in most of these words that define salvation has this prefix, right? This re, okay? Any, every, every word that is associated with our salvation uh, has this prefix called re. That means he's restoring restoration okay uh, reconciliation uh, rede we are redeemed okay uh, we were lost but we are found so uh, that that's a wonderful uh, you know note right there and that we were lost but we were found because of jesus because of his sacrifice on the cross and then paul urges us to live our lives uh, as a living sacrifice and hebrews 13 15 says Therefore, by him, by whom? Therefore, by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay, note this line, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay, uh, let's move on. The innocent animal represented the sinner and took his place on the altar. The imagery which brought an incredible awareness of the seriousness of sin and the payment being death. Only then could you be accepted and declared clean. The blood of the animal would cover God un, uh, until God himself, the Lamb of God, would come and take away the sins of the world. Okay, So that every blood, the blood of every animal that was shed was just a covering. Okay, But God was not satisfied. That's why in John 1.29, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus took our sins away once and for all. It was his blood when it hit the mercy seat was not just a covering for our sins. It was he he it was a clean slate once again. He made it white as snow. Okay. So the gate, as we saw, is the introduction to a Christian life, but the altar, in other words, the imagery of the cross is the door to the presence of God. Okay, uh, so everything is born at the cross. The worship is born at the cross. The revelation of, of God's grace and mercy is, is, you know, is born at the cross. We begin to have that revelation at the cross. Okay, so after, after that is done, after you've offered up your sacrifices, you can't stay there. Okay, so here's the thing, right? Uh, most of our, uh, most, uh, most Christians, uh, are happy with just knowing that Jesus died for them uh, for, on the cross. That's it. They'll stop there. They don't want to progress. They don't want to keep going deeper in, in their relationship with him. But we can't stop here, isn't it? Uh, the next piece of furniture that's in the outer courts is the bronze laver. And we're going to call this place as the place of the sanctification. Okay, so the gate was the introduction, the bronze, uh, the bronze altar, the altar of sacrifice was a place of reconciliation, and the bronze laver is the place of sanctification. Okay, uh, can someone uh, just uh, help us by reading, uh, you know, this this part of the scriptures that's in the notes, please?
someone, which is what, whatever's on the screen. Okay, let's go for it. Yeah. From the top or the second one? Uh, the top one, the this one, the, this section. The Exodus right. 30, 17 to 21. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a lever of brazen, a uh, bronze, uh, with its base also of bronze for washing. You, you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it from Aaron, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a status forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to read that again, just so we understand the seriousness of, of what just God is talking about this place, right? Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a labor of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar of sacrifice. And you shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting or, or when they come near the altar to minister to the burn, uh, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. And it shall be a statue for them forever to him and his descendants throughout his generations. So this was a place of sanctification. This was a place of cleansing, of washing. Right, um, the labor of bronze, a place of washing and cleansing, where Aaron and his sons just had to wash before they could enter the holy place. And you will read more about it in Leviticus chapter eight, verse five and six. Okay, um, what does this tell us today? Uh, Kiran, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes, sir. I want to just clarify it once again uh, what the scripture is saying, Exodus 30, 17 to 21, sir. Yes. So can you explain a little oh, more? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is another altar. It's called the bronze laver. It's like a big uh, tub so to say okay a big tub and inside that it was inside it was made up of mirrors okay mirrors and we'll get to uh, you know there's a scripture that that signifies the importance of that uh, mirrors that uh, the women used okay and again the details of it is in exodus you can read it and that chamber that is like a water basin was filled with water and that was used for aaron and his sons to wash the priests basically to wash their hands and their feet before they entered the holy place okay the holy place you know where the three furnishes were there the table of showbread the golden lampstand and the altar of incense so the, the priests will not enter that the, the holy place the tabernacle without washing their hands and their feet okay so that's basically what the uh, significance and the importance of that is and what it tells us is that we are to purify ourselves, to cleanse ourselves. Uh, remember, this place is called the place of sanctification, a place of cleansing. Okay. Um, in the notes, you will see we wash ourselves of the impurities of the day, uh, the impurities of life uh, with the word of God. Okay. And we see that in John 15, 3. Can... Um, <clears throat> I want one of us to read John 15, 3, and the other person to read Ephesians 5, 26, and one of us can go to Titus 3, 5, and one of us to Hebrews 10, 22, please. Can, can we do that? Fast, fast. John can someone read? Yes, thanks. You're already, you're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
Thank you. So we see that by, by the word of God, we are made clean, right? The word of God purifies us, cleanses us, right? Uh, someone, Ephesians 5.26, please. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It's wonderful. Uh, can you read that again, Dave? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the washing of water by the word. It's interesting, isn't it? Once again, how uh, the word of God cleanses us, washes us from all our impurities. Um, and the work of the spirit, as it says in Titus 3.5. Can someone read Titus 3.5, please? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us to the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Titus. Uh, that verse is really good. Can you read that again for us, please? Not by work of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> okay, so we are again cleansed by the Holy Spirit, um, and we, as we read. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, uh, is anybody there? Let us draw near. Okay, go ahead. Let us draw near with the true heart in full and assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil consciousness and our bodies washed with the pure water. Thank you, Kiran. Okay, so let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance, okay, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so we cleanse our hearts uh, of an evil conscience with the blood of Jesus. Okay, there's full assurance that we are made whole and we are made righteous. Okay, and from the previous scripture that we just read from Titus 3, 5. Now, <clears throat> the priests washed their hands and their feet. Okay, now their hands represented, <clears throat> excuse me, the works, deeds, okay, deeds or uh, works. That means they worked, they, you know, the, but their hands would get dirty. Okay, um, but now because of Jesus, uh, Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross, we don't have to work, we live by grace. Okay, we don't have to do things to make us righteous. We are made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Amen. But, however, we still have to walk this walk of life. Isn't it? We still live in this, in this fleshly body. That means we still have to walk. Uh, and because we, because we are uh, in this fleshly bodies, um, this flesh is capable of committing the acts of sin. Right? We are we are capable of lying. We are capable of committing murder. We are capable of stealing. We are capable of doing a lot of wrong things, a lot of impure things. So we walk the walk of life, and that's why we need to cleanse ourselves. Okay. Um, and once again, another reference that, which I really like, and I post it in the chat, is from Ezekiel um, chapter thirty-six, verse twenty-five. It says. God is saying, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Okay. Um, another significance that I mentioned was the inside of this basin, this big water basin, right, was made of mirrors. And uh, in, can we just go to quickly go to James chapter one? James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. 
I'll read it for us, okay? James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Do what the word says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law Okay, look at that. Now the imagery is changing. But the man who looks intently into the perfect word of God that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. That's awesome, isn't it? Uh, you know, where the God's word is, is shown as a mirror. And when, you know, and the and what happens? I mean, when you look at a mirror, you know what are the flaws, okay, and and uh, what needs to be corrected, uh, what needs to be set right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And God's word does that to us. And as we read His word, uh, you know, He it purifies us, it cleanses us, like we just read in John 15 and Ephesians chapter five uh, and James chapter one and two. Okay, so in conclusion. They washed their hands because they had to work. The day is the priests, okay? The priest washed their hands because they had to work. We don't because of the grace. The price is already paid. Sacrifice is done. But we still have to walk this life. And that is why we read, we go to his word for cleansing of ourselves, okay? Uh, and Psalm 119 verse 9, this actually, this whole psalm, uh, talks about the importance of the word of God, right? How can a young man keep his ways pure by living according to the word of God? Amen. We remember that word, isn't it? Verse, yeah. Right. Uh, are you guys okay? Uh, questions so far? Are we all clear? Okay, there's this is so much of insights that we can go into, uh, you know, this each and every piece of furniture, but uh, we don't need to, uh, you know, for what we are. But there's just a lot more. There's so much more scripture, so many more verses, that, uh, uh, so much more revelation uh, from the tabernacle of Moses about who Jesus is. Okay, so right here we are. Uh, we finished the gate. Uh, we entered through. Uh, we are in the outer courts, where we where we encounter Jesus at the cross, the altar of sacrifice, which is a place of reconciliation, and then the bronze labor, which is a place of sanctification, and uh, where we are cleansed. We go to His Word to be cleansed. Uh, we ought to be cleansed. Okay. Now, we cannot settle down in the outer courts, isn't it? Right? As mentioned, some of us make the mistake of us of just doing the cleansing thing, offering up spiritual sacrifices, uh, attend church every Sunday, uh, feel very happy and good about it, and uh, and not really do anything to go deeper into our relationship with God. Okay, um, so let's go past the outer courts into the holy place now, okay? There was a curtain that separated the outer courts from the inner court. So here we go. The inner court, also known as the holy place. And as soon as you enter to your right, you'll find a table of showbread which we are going to call it as a place of sanctification. Now, let me see if I can just stop sharing the screen for a moment uh, and let's see if I can show us an image of uh, what it looks like on the inside. Now, I'm sure you already know how it looks like, but just for the benefit of everybody else. Okay. I hope you can see. All right now, um, 
this is like from the bird's eye view from the top okay uh, you see the entrance of the gate the gate was always facing the east okay the gate was always facing the east and you enter through the gate and then in the outer court you had the altar of burnt offerings and the bronze laver and then as you enter the inner courts or the holy place here you see it you find the table of showbread the golden lampstand and the altar of incense and then there was another veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place okay um, now once again another thing that i'd like you all to notice is in the outer courts there was natural light there was a natural daylight uh, right of the sun or of the moon but as you entered in there was artificial light that was given by the golden lampstand okay but in the holy place in the most holy place there was divine light um, you know the light of god would shine in this place okay so let me stop uh, this and just go back to our notes. Hope you've got a good picture of it. Right. So the table of showbread was, uh, it, it was a place, it was a table on which 12 loaves of bread was kept. And uh, it's explained to us in Exodus 26, 30. Can someone read this scripture, please? That's on the notes. Okay. And ye shall rise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward, toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall forever, for you shall make for the screen five pillars of Achaia wood, and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Okay. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> right, uh, and another scripture that mentioned there is, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure uh, oil of pressed olives for the light to, con uh, to cause the lamp to burn continually. That's for the golden lampstand as well. So, the meaning of the table of the showbread, it means it was the bread of the face or the bread of the presence of God. Bread said before the face or the presence of God. That's what it actually means. There's uh, a couple of spellings that uh, changes. One is a uh, table of showbread, uh, S-H-O-W. Uh, in some translations, translations use table of shoebread, S-H-E-W. Okay, But they all mean the same. Uh, the meaning is uh, the bread set before the presence uh, or the face of God, okay? The showbread represents our daily bread, okay? In um, John chapter six, right? Uh, yeah. John chapter six, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst right um, so this is the place of satisfaction okay the table of shoe bread uh, which shows that jesus is our daily bread it is the it is the meeting of our spiritual need through the word of god it is also the bread of divine provision of having our natural needs met okay this is a place of reminder where god provided for israel supernaturally 
And then according to Philippians 4.19, we see that we satisfy ourselves knowing that Jesus, the provider, he is a Jehovah Jireh. Amen. Um, and you can read in detail that from John 6, 51 to 58, where he says that I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And so time and time again, uh, we see that, uh, you know, Jesus referring himself uh, as the bread of life. Okay. And every seventh or Sabbath day, fresh hot loaves were provided by Aaron. Uh, the priests were entitled to eat the old loaves while standing in the holy place. Frankincense was sprinkled on the bread. Okay. It tastes bitter. Frankincense. Okay. It tastes bitter. Uh, and so, I mean, it's, it's very strange uh, as an, I mean, when I was searching on why would they sprinkle frankincense? Uh, you know, something that would taste bitter on the bread. Um, you know, one of the commentary uh, said that uh, it, the word also brings persecution, right? The message of the gospel of Jesus uh, brings persecution. It's, bit, it's bitter in taste. So bitterness always, uh, you know, symbolizes uh, persecution. So um, a lot of things happening here at the table of showbread. It's a place of satisfaction. It's a place where we encounter Jesus as a provider, as a supernatural provider, where we come to him for satisfaction, for everything. And in Jesus, we are satisfied. Amen. In Jesus, I am satisfied. Right. He satisfies me. He quenches my thirst. Amen. Okay, moving on, we come to the fifth place, fifth piece of furniture, the golden lampstand. And let's call it the place of illumination. Okay, um, Exodus chapter 26, verse 30, 35, and 37 it says, And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall set table outside the veil and the lampstand across the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south and you shall put the table on the north side it's okay i mean i think i know it's there's so much of details but every time i read the details i'm amazed like god is saying here place the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south like he is even telling okay which direction it should be placed um, I mean, uh, th that is amazing. <laughs> and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle woven in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by the weaver. Okay, so this was a place uh, of illumination. Uh, this was a golden lampstand. Again, referring to where Jesus says that I am the light of the world, isn't it? Right. And um, in Matthew chapter eight, let me I'm just trying to paste Matthew eight verse twelve. Again, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, "I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life." I mean, that's, uh, but before we get a little deeper into that, we see what other scriptures say. Uh, in Exodus 27, 20, 21, it says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So that, that lamp was never to go off. It was supposed to burn 24 hours, seven days a week throughout the year. And it was the job, it was the duty of the priest to replace the oil, to replace the bread, uh, everything. Okay, So twice every day, morning and evening, priest attended to the wick. Wick is the thread uh, you know, uh, in, in that lamp. And replenished the pure beaten olive oil for the lamps. Yes, can you think them doing this every single day? I mean, every day, not just replacing the lamp, but it had to be fresh 
pure beaten olive oil for the lambs. Like they had to produce and extract fresh olive oil every day. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's just uh, that's amazing to me, right? And on the lamp, there is oil and fire producing light representing illumination and revelation. This is the illumination and revelation which the Holy Spirit brings into our lives. Like when he comes into our lives, he reveals, he begins to reveal who this Jesus is. And we have this amazing revelation after revelation after revelation of who this Jesus is. Um, right? Um, wait, is there another scripture that I wanted to share? Uh, there's a wonderful, uh, you know, quote by C.S. Lewis. Um, let me just share that to us. Okay. Um, it's a, he says, um, is, he starts off with this question, is Jesus the true light to you? C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sunrise. Not only because I see it, but because but because by it, I see all things. His word is a lamp unto our feet, right? And the Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, His, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He, he reveals there's an illumination that is happening. There's a revelation that is happening. Um, the one more verse. Let's. Uh, is, it, is it too much of Bible reading for us today? Okay, uh, let's go to Second Corinthians, please. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter Okay, um, just for us to get the context, I'm going to read from verse 3. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 3. Right, are you all with me? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. thank you. It says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing okay even if our gospel is veiled what is veiled it's even if it's covered veiled right uh, like a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place right? what does a veil do it kind of it's like a mask it covers isn't it so saying even if our gospel is covered if it's veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing verse 4 the god of this age okay lowercase small g it's referring to satan or the enemy right the god of this age or another translation it says the god of this world has blinded the minds okay has veiled their minds has covered their minds okay blind they cannot see has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of christ okay notice those words they cannot see the light of the gospel. That means the gospel is the light. Je Jesus is a light, right? The gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For verse 6, follow with me, guys. Verse 6, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. Okay, notice the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
if you have time today, read that verse like a hundred times, okay? <laughs> verse six, can I read that one more time, please? Uh, it says, for God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts and give us the light of the knowledge. Give us the light of revelation. Knowledge, in other words, is revelation, right? You are understanding something. There's a revelation of it. That's what knowledge is. You, you give us the light of the revelation of what? Of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So in the, in the light of the face of Jesus, there is life. Amen. Are you guys with me? In the light of the face of Jesus, there is life. Um, Okay, uh, just one last scripture. Let's go to Proverbs. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Last scripture and we're going to close today. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, guys. Proverbs... Uh... Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 15. I was getting mixed. Pro Proverbs chapter 16, verse 15. Okay, it says, In the light of the king's face is life. In the light of the king's face is life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. But uh, that's wonderful just to conclude what we've learned so far, isn't it? Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen here. The last thing we looked at uh, was the golden lampstand. It is a place of illumination. Uh, it's a place of divine light, um, and which signifies and symbolizes Jesus saying that I am the light of the world. Right, and then we see that in this powerful scripture in Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six, that in the light of the knowledge or the revelation of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. And in as it says in Proverbs sixteen fifteen, in the light of the king's face is life. Amen. Um, so we'll stop here for today. Uh, we've covered. Uh, until page 20 of, of the golden lamp stand. So we will resume next week uh, with the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant and we move on from there. Right? Um, are you guys with me? Uh, everybody okay? Are, we, are you able to take off something so far? Aaron, Thomas, Prince. Awesome. Okay, guys. I'm, I'm glad. Okay. Uh, but when you can, please go back and uh, read the scriptures, reread the scriptures, uh, at least especially Second Corinthians 4, the verse that we just read, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal. Okay. Uh, man, I'm just reminded of just one more verse. I'm, I am so sorry. Okay. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 18. Okay. Psalm 119, verse 18. 119 verse 18. Okay. It says, Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law. Okay, open my eyes to the wonderful things in your word. Uh, and uh, as you read the word, uh, and as you reread the word, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, uh, you know, for Him to reveal, uh, you know, the beauty and the wonderful things that is, you know, just. just there for us. Amen. Let's pray and we'll close today. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us. Help us to be sensitive, Father, to your voice, to your leading. Thank you for the price you paid for us. Lord, I pray that every day of our lives that we will walk in accordance to your word as you cleanse us, as you purify us with your blood and with your word, Father. 
I thank you for uh, every student that is, uh, is listening, that is hearing. Father, I pray that you will continue to pour out your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding over us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.